Good morning. Or good afternoon, actually. I'm Pastor Jason. Coming to you again this Sunday afternoon. Uh, for some reason, we're still having trouble getting the bugs worked out on our sound. So this morning's worship... Go ahead and take this off. This morning's worship was unable without sound, so I didn't upload it. So I'm coming to you this afternoon to bring you some announcements and some message. In upcoming events and messages right now for this Sunday, uh, the Temple Builders Sunday School class will begin a book study on Wednesday, December 2nd, 2020. We will be reading the book Soul Coma, written by Scott Langier. Longyear, excuse me. Our class will be like, would like to invite the entire church family and anybody who's listening out there, that includes you, uh, to participate in this study. This study will be a, a live online format using Google Meets. If you are not familiar with this live online format of Google Meets, the platform, um, you can contact me, Pastor Jason, at the email for the church, or if you have Greg Linton's email, contact him. And we will make sure that you get uh, easy directions to follow on how to use Google Meets and then an invite to log in the day of the study. Now, this study provides a great avenue to awaken the Holy Spirit in our lives during these challenging times. So I ask you to join us Wednesday, December 2nd, 2020 at 7 p.m. from the comfort and safety of your own home as we study key components to walking up, waking up, and to an extraordinary life, as a quote from the book. If you plan to participate, please let Greg Linton or me on the Messenger website or even contact on this uh, video uh, by December 1st so we can include you in the Google Meet invitation that's sent out. But looking forward to that, and hopefully in the near future, uh, the author, Scott Longyear, pastor, Reverend Scott Longyear, uh, has agreed to join us on one of the evenings during the study to help talk about the book. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, also, uh, Monday, tomorrow, November 23rd, at Center Point United Methodist Church from 2 p.m. to 7 p.m., they are having the third annual Pastor Bob Memorial Blood Drive. And walk-ins are welcome. Um, and right now they don't have a lot of appointments, so anytime between 2 and 7, you're probably going to be able to get in pretty quickly. But the need for blood and blood platelets and products are necessary, especially in a time of COVID. Uh, if you feel the need uh, to venture out, uh, please wear a mask and take precautions. But hopefully we'd like to see at Center Point United Methodist Church in Center Point, Indiana, November, th you know, tomorrow, Monday, November 23rd, between 2 and 7. And that's all I have in announcements. I hope everybody's doing well. This Sunday, November 22nd, 2020, is on the liturgical calendar, or the Christian calendar, is Christ the King Sunday. Now, this is the Sunday where we celebrate the Lordship of Jesus to all the world. He is the Divine One whom all believers are in covenant with, the whole world is obligated to, and they will one day acknowledge Christ as King of kings and Lord of lords. So let's remember this truth as we worship today. This morning's responsive reading in During Church was Psalm 100, and I'll read that for you right now. It's Psalm 100. It says, A Psalm for Giving Grateful Praise. It says, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. 
Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Wonderful sentiment, wonderful song on Christ the King Sunday because it puts in perspective who we are in God's kingdom and who he is to us. Now in this reading, I will use Holy One instead of Lord or Him, Father, because uh, we are the Holy One's people. We are the sheep of His pasture. To be more succinct, our life is not our own. Something to think about. Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you for your grace that welcomed us into your kingdom and your sacrifice that paid for our citizenship. Divine beloved, open our eyes to, to the fullness of your realm that we may become good stewards and heirs with you in your holy kingdom. Amen. I hope all are well. I hope as citizens of the kingdom of God that we have the full joy of knowing this and that truth gives us encouragement this morning. This morning's gospel lesson comes out of the book of Matthew, chapter 25. We're going to end the chapter here. Verses 31 through 46. And we're describing and talking about the parable of the sheep and the goats. That's Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46. I'll be reading this out of the New International Version. It says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him. Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger, or needing clothes, or sick, or in prison, and did not help you? He will reply, Truly I tell you, Whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Let us pray. Divine Beloved, hear our prayer this morning. Please forgive our apathy toward the oppressed and the marginalized. Please forgive our ignorance and unawareness for those around us who are emotionally and mentally hurting. But most of all, please forgive us that we have neglected to recognize your image embedded in the faces and souls of individuals surrounding us. Allow us to know if we are a sheep or a goat. We ask this upon hearing your word proclaimed today. Amen.
Now, today's text is the last of Jesus' parables in Matthew's Gospel about how Christians should live and act after he is gone. These are found in chapters 24 through 25. We see a pattern of each time, a pattern of the end times. These parables were, excuse me, we see a pattern of end time parables where Jesus describes stories about individuals who were caught off guard by an authoritative figure, a bridegroom, a banquet host, a businessman or master, and finally a king. In each parable, individuals or groups of individuals find themselves being rejected, thrown out, and or condemned by it because of their actions. Today's parable is probably the most famous of these parables. The theme of this parable, the sheep and the goats, has been used in secular culture and other spiritual and inspirational storytelling. Now, when I read the scripture this week, I thought, excuse me, got a glare on my paper here. Much better. When I read the scripture this week, I thought of, of the TV show, Undercover Boss. Now, just like I asked the others, how many of you have seen that TV show? I like it. On each episode, an owner, well, for those of you who do not know or haven't seen the show, I'm going to break it down for you. On each episode, an owner or a CEO of a company puts on a disguise and takes an, takes an entry-level position in the company. Now, the boss then must be trained and evaluated by his own employees. The boss often experiences both negative and positive attitudes and work ethics of the company employees about their jobs. The experience always seems to be life-changing at the end of each episode when all the company employees assemble and the boss reveals what he has learned during his time undercover. Some outstanding employees are rewarded for their excellence. Some are given resources to overcome personal hardship but some are, are reprimanded. Some are taken and put back into training to help remind them what their job is. And sadly enough, even some are dismissed because of their lack of integrity on the job. Now, every person who had direct contact with the boss had a life-changing experience. But overall, the lives of all the employees of the company were changed because the CEO usually implements company-wide changes from what he has learned. What he or she has learned, excuse me. Let's be PC. This is much like today's scripture. Whether a sheep or a goat, all of them had no idea when they had an interaction with the king or with Jesus same person. All asked when they had or had not given aid to the king, and just like the employees on the TV show, the undercover boss got to see how each individual treated their cohorts and approached daily obstacles, showing if they upheld the standards and ethics of the organization. You see, the king, or Christ Jesus, the divine judge, separates individuals into two categories in the scripture. First, the sheep on his right are those who lived out their faith in Jesus Christ by doing what Jesus taught and treating others with the love and respect, not only as a lifestyle, excuse me, as a lifestyle of righteousness. Now the goats are individuals who live for themselves only and in their hubris led a selfish, egocentric life. These individuals may have helped one or two people, but they did it for personal glory and self-recognition. Now, I'm going to ask you a very difficult question. Are you a sheep or a goat? The answer to this question is always in your intent. What motivates you to do acts of kindness, to do benevolence work, 
or humanitarian work? Does it look good on an application or a resume? Did it help you get credit at school or in a job or even for your FIFO score? Or do you work serving others simply because it is the right thing to do? You see, when we accept Jesus Christ into our hearts, we make a commitment to live each day for him. We open our hearts and minds to see the world around us It is by looking around us it allows us to see how people truly are, who they were created to be, and how God looks at each individual. But this only happens if we apply the teaching of Jesus into our lives. We must let Christ's transformation, his love and his grace, move us out of being just simply a human being living and existing to a believer, a new creation, moving towards perfection, allowing our journey to lead us to a better place, to where our heart and mind is focused on God and looks at things the way Christ would. To do this, we must be shaped by Christ's imagination, formed by his example. Being a believer means that we must do the things that Christ did. We must act on what we know to be right. We must show others that we have a faith in Jesus Christ that is transformative by Christ's love for us and for them. It is our ability to go out and show others, regardless of their station, regardless of their economic or financial value, regardless of where they, at, they are at in their life, we must show them that they are valued by God and that, Christ's, that Christ works through us to show how he sees them and us. Let me repeat that. Christ Jesus works through us and through those who believe to show us how he sees us and how he sees others. Now in the parable of the sheep, These sheep are recognized by Christ by their actions and their attitudes towards one another. You see, a faith journey following Christ means learning to serve others, and by that serve service, we grow in our grace. And it's in that grace walk we learn to serve others. That growth happens by doing the things that Jesus did, feeding the hungry, clothing the poor, sheltering the homeless, caring for the sick, educating the ignorant, visiting the prisons, and addressing systematic injustices. These actions are formative, not only in our own spiritual life, but in the lives of those we serve. It changes them. And in their gratitude, we are changed. You ever done something good for somebody? Just something simple. You know, when you don't know anybody, you try to go get a, a simple gift. I remember back when I was a kid, they always recognized Mother's Day and Father's Day. And if you were a mom in the church, all the women got some kind of little bitty flower start, little petunia or carnation or whatever it was, but they got a little small potted plant. All the moms did. Well, then when it was Father's Day, all the men in the church got white, plain white handkerchiefs. And I always wondered about that. If I was going to be recognized for something as wonderful as being a parent or rearing children or investing in the lives of young ones, would I want just a blanket gift? Now, it meant something, but it was just a token. 
But what happens when we invest and get to know that person? When we get to see who they are, their likes and dislikes? What if the person likes turtles? Or they like frogs? Or they like butterflies? Or hummingbirds? Maybe they're the type of person that likes those little bitty tiny spoons you get at the truck stops in different states. What happens when you're out and about doing your work in your daily life and you see something, one of these items that reminds you of this individual because you know it's what fuels their hearts and their passion and you buy it for them? What happens when you give it to them? There's joy, there's surprise, there's elation, and they can't believe you thought about them. They're just overjoyed that that small act of love, because while you were away, you were thinking of them. You thought of enough of them to buy them something that meant something to them. And what did it cost us? We deepened a relationship. We gave a person a bit of joy in their life. One of the most unique answers I ever got when I did something like that, I pulled out a 50 cent turtle figurine and I gave it to the individual because I knew that they loved turtles. And their eyes welled up with tears, they stopped and they looked at me and just gave me the biggest hug I think I'd ever gotten from them. And I was kind of surprised at the reaction. They looked at me and said, hey, how did you know I was having the worst possible day of my life? How did you know that everything was falling apart? I didn't think anybody cared whether I was, what happened to me today? And suddenly that little 50 cent trinket meant the world to somebody who felt isolated and alone cut off from God and cut off from everybody. Truth is, you didn't know what they were going through, but the Holy Spirit knew. And because when we as Christians yield to the little calling, the still small voice of the Holy Spirit, it allows us to change lives, even if it is in a simple trinket or a simple act. Because it wasn't about the turtle, it was about the investment that you acted upon knowing what that person liked and you thought about it. You know, these actions are what Christ uses to know us and to know others. It's what Christ uses to reach out to people. This is what it means to be missional. I'm sure you've heard me use the word missional before or heard it in conference things as United Methodist. Being missional means going out and working and doing the acts that Jesus taught, exactly like in the scripture, feeding the poor, feeding the hungry, helping the sick. You know, and I'll take it a step further. It's not just missional. It's not just what others see and how Christ recognizes as one of his this is also what it means to be a citizen of the kingdom of God, to live in the true realm of God. Now, as if I haven't called out people enough, I'm going to take it a step further. What if you're a goat? We've talked about the sheep, and I've defined what it meant to be a goat, someone who's selfish and self-serving. But what if you're a goat? How many goats do you know that are in the church today? Or they call themselves Christian by definition, but you don't see it in any of their actions. Not just the ones that you've been raised up to believe are Christian acts, but what the Bible says are Christian acts, like we've read this morning. If you are a goat and you have no interest in going out and doing acts of service or helping others and everything you do is self-serving, I'm going to ask you a question. Why? Why would you want to be involved in something 
knowing that this is seriously important, the acts that we talked about, the humanitarian acts, the basic and simple acts of meeting the needs of others in the name of Jesus, Christ sees these things as seriously important. Why then, if you don't want to do them, do you want to be associated with a kingdom or a realm that is all about this? This is the reign of Christ. This is the call of the church to be actively helping others, actively loving others, actively going out and treating others with respect and love. If you're not into that, why would you want to call yourself a Christian? Why would you want to be in a kingdom where that's all that the kingdom is about? See, this is the true plight of the goats. They must choose to do for others from a humble heart, not for working for self. They must learn to be in the kingdom of Christ and realize that they neglected to be transformed and grow in their faith. You see, everything God and Christ commands is not just one-sided. It has multiple meanings, multiple understandings, and it touches many lives. When we go out and we serve others, when you go and do something simple, just like I described that little turtle, even if something as simple as buying a little trinket, and you begin to invest in others, just like that big hug I got, realizing God was using me, changed me. It was significant to the receiver because they felt like God had heard them. They felt like God had not forsaken them. They felt like God had sent someone to share in their burden. Both lives were changed, weren't they? You see, I think about this. For me, I've always said, if you've been under my preaching and my teaching, I've always said the easiest way to share the gospel of Jesus Christ is to smile. Smile and just because smiles are infectious. You smile at somebody, they kind of smile back. And most people do. And it's the easiest and simplest thing to do. But since we've been during COVID, I can't smile. Nobody sees that because when I'm all covered up and I smile, all you see is these squinty eyes. And I just look like I can't see very well. And I asked, Lord, why in the world would you allow this to happen? This is holding me back. I'm so frustrated. And the Lord simply responded to me, Jason, get imaginative, get creative. Stop relying on old ways of doing things, the old things that work best for you, that's easy for you. Get out of your comfort zone and do something that changes lives, that meets them where they're at. Learn to move and pivot, be flexible and nimble. Take on new roles and ways to share my gospel. That's what the Lord told me. So we must choose for ourselves to you be in service to others. Because when we don't do something, when we don't grow, when we don't serve, we don't get that reciprocated, transformative under, you know, moment. And you lose the ability to grow in your faith. But don't get me wrong, reading your Bible, praying, meditating, all these things, acts of spiritual devotion, yes, they help you grow but it doesn't mean anything if you don't follow through with acts, with doing things that support what you learn through the scriptures. So I ask you, are you growing in your faith? 
We're in a time of a pandemic where our normal ability to serve others is hindered by this virus, this disease. But still, we must carry on. We must find new ways to help others. We must find different ways, more inventive ways to share the gospel. We cannot let the hindrance of the pandemic slow us down from helping others and still continue to grow as the body of Christ. We must find ways to continue to show God's grace and love. How do we do this? Phone calls, greeting cards, sending emails, sending those video calls, buying those simple 50 cent trinkets, just letting somebody know that you appreciate them, words of encouragement and affirmation. But the worst thing we could do is stop being the church, stop our spiritual growth and transformation, and sanctification. Because we can't think of something new and different that we feel is effective. We can continue to reach out to others multiple ways. And still, there are those who are actively, right now, delivering food to people. Actively going out and taking blankets to the homeless. Actively going out in the midst of COVID and trying to treat others. Whether it's leaving food, groceries on a doorstep, leaving meals on a doorstep. going and picking up medicines for people and delivering it to their mailbox or to their doorstep. There are still people trying to be the church. So why can't we? Excuse me, I lost my place. <laughs> I can't help but think about those who work in healthcare right now. What do they do each day? They are right on the front line treating people with COVID-19, exposing themselves to the chance of getting this virus because they're committed to helping others. It may be their occupation, but I know plenty of people of faith that work in the hospitals and in the nursing homes that work tires, tirelessly to make sure others are taken care of. I've got a cousin. She lives in El Paso, Texas, and I don't know if you all follow the news, but several months ago, El Paso's hospitals were overrun with COVID patients. They were in serious need of new beds and new help because the numbers were constantly going up of those that were contracting the virus and those who were dying. My young cousin, she's in her 20s. She's a nurse. She works at the hospital. One day she posted on Facebook, this is my uniform for work. And she looked, I'll be honest, the outfit she was wearing looked like a hazmat suit on steroids. She had gloves on, all taped up, multiple layers of gloves, a bodysuit that covered everything up, and it was all sealed in multiple places. She had those sock things over her shoes. She had a mask on, a, a little cap to go over her hair, and a face shield. And she said, when I get going during the day, it gets hot and it gets miserable. She said, but somebody needs to be here to take care of the patients. She says, I came into being a healthcare worker and wanted to be a nurse so that I could help people and nurse them back to health. She never imagined when she took that job career that she'd be on the front lines of a pandemic. But yet she does it. And I guarantee you, we know we all know somebody who works in the healthcare still who's eyeball deep in COVID cases. 
I ask you, how are we supporting them who are true heroes? Our emergency service workers and those that are trying to keep things in a normal place. Are we sending care packages to our nurses and doctors? Are we calling them and sending cards to let them know that we appreciate what they're doing? Nursing those of us, some of us who's had, you know, had the virus, excuse me, and those of us who have family who's had the virus. What are we doing to encourage those doctors and caregivers? There are plenty of things we could be doing right now to share the love of God, to keep people encouraged and move us forward, not only as a community, but as a nation. I'm gonna speak with you now, talk about citizenship. What does it mean to be a citizen in the kingdom of God? It means knowing and working as Christ did. We must take our place as citizens in this kingdom. You see in verse 34 of Matthew's gospel, chapter 25, it says, then the king will say to those on his right, the sheep, be calm, be at peace. You who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance. The kingdom that is prepared for you since the creation of the world. You see, we as believers, those who walk with Christ, those who are seeking transformation and growing in grace, we were, we are meant to be, and we're always meant to be heirs with Christ Jesus. So I encourage you right now, where you're at, to take ownership of this truth. I look at it this way. If you or even myself, if we own something or have a vested interest in the and how, <clears throat> excuse me, if we owned a property or a business or had a large corporation, we would be very, very much invested in how it worked and how it grew. We would want to know how it was being ran. We wouldn't leave it up to someone else to just to take care of it. You'd want to be involved and you want to know how it was running and who the people are that was running the country the company. You'd want to know how people are doing things because you want to make sure that your business or your company or your venture would grow and be ran the way you believe it to be true. So, what does this apply to? Well, why wouldn't you want to know this in your own household or in your own community? Why wouldn't you want to be invested in how those are being ran? Wouldn't you? You see, that is the question. How many of us are not only aware of what's going on around us, the shortcomings of the social system and welfare system, the secret things that go on in our neighbor's life that they're not talking about? Because they're hurting. I implore you to get excited about the truth that we are joint heirs with Christ for the throne of heaven. We must get involved because of this truth. You are a prince or a princess of the royal court of God. This truth alone should encourage you This should encourage you because not only does it allow you to have a goal, your growth in your own life, but that the end game, not only in this kingdom, but in the kingdom to come, eternity. This parable of the sheep and the goats calls into question people's salvation experience. For according to the story, if you have truly had an experience of the Holy Spirit through Christ Jesus, then you will be actively working in the kingdom of God, showing your faith by your actions. 
This is why the scripture says in the other in the epistles, they will know we are Christians by our love. I know for myself, when I was a new Christian, I had a hard time forgiving other individuals. I had a difficult time loving the unlovable. I had a difficult time forgiving and loving those I considered to be my enemy or more correctly, those who considered me their enemy. But you know, over time, I realized my life was a whole lot less stressful, less anxious, and more blessed and fruitful because I learned to let God carry the load and just love those around me. I did this and was able to finally come to peace with loving people and get a reason to love them because I realized the image of God, the image of Christ, is in each and every being I met. It's in me, it's in you, it's in everybody around us because God created us in his image. This meant I had a good reason to love those who acted like my enemy. And just like the parable tells us, I was able to show my faith to everyone through acts of kindness and love, through the ability to forgive and forget. So do we treat those around us, the stranger on the street, the acquaintance at work, or the next door neighbor that seems to be nosy or always getting into your business? Do we treat them as if they are the image of Christ? See, I started treating the individuals in the street. The individual strangers I met, the acquaintances, as if they were Jesus. I began to invest my time and my empathy into their life. I wanted to get to know them better than just a passerby. And I realized when I began to want those things, I was wanting the same thing Jesus did. So I encourage you today to grow in your faith by taking the small steps to show love during a pandemic. Begin to grow in your understanding of the teachings of Christ by living by his example. Allow those around you to know your faith by your actions. Be an owner-operator of the world around you. That which was created for you since the beginning of time. Would you be that person that celebrates Christ in each person's life so that they might understand and want to know Jesus? Let us pray. Gracious Lord, allow us today to take our place in your kingdom, that we may become active members of your royal court not in the way that is self-serving but in a way that allows us not only to live in abundance along with your Holy Spirit in the life that we live now in the midst of the pandemic but also knowing that eternity comes and when we pass from this life we continue into your kingdom. Lord, you call us this day to continue to share your faith through our actions and to show those who are isolated, hurting, and in pain that you are still God and we are still your covenant people. Embolden us today, Lord, Open our minds to be who you want us to be and allow us to serve others just as we would serve you. Amen. I pray the Lord blesses you today. I pray that God encourages you. 
God bless you and have a wonderful week.